Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. Christmas is around the corner, which is next week, so why not uh, review a Christmas movie? And that is Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. Which is the sequel to the surprising hit, Home Alone, which came out in 1990. Which follows Kevin McAllister, played by Macaulay Cogan, who's left home alone in his Chicago home by his family you know, after they went on a Paris uh, vacation during the holidays. So they realize that they forgot him, and they're hoping to find a way to to get back. So apparently, he's all alone, gets to do whatever he wants since he made his whole family disappear until he meets um, the two wet bandits Harvey and Marv played by Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern and also getting scared by an old man played by Robert Blossom this time he wants up um, going on a trip which is supposed to be uh, the Miami Florida vacation that he was going to go with his family only he wants to take in the wrong plane to New York and taking the bite out of the Big Apple, exploring several places around. And not only that, but of course he gets to stay in the Plaza Hotel. You know, get to have the freedom and fun that he ever wants. And goes to a local toy store until he wants up getting bumped into the Web Bandits again. Yeah, Harvey and Marv. Yeah, so, well, it did suffer from deja vu, I mean, when it comes to sequels. But, I can't help it. I think it's still the best sequel ever made uh, for its time. I mean, because I just feel like Home Alone is just becoming the only movie that's getting more of, of the popularity. Um, even though this is still popular... I just feel like Fox really need to do a better job, you know, putting some more effort to it. Because all they gave us is a standalone Blu-ray, but it does come with a DVD and a digital copy. And has a slip cover. Yeah, the cover art isn't any special. I mean, they give it a red background and, and you only see uh, you know, Kevin you know, wearing a beanie and, and you see both... Uh, you know, Harry and, and Marv, yeah, look like, you know, they're hanging on to something. <laughs> I mean, yeah, e even in the back, as you can see right there, but you do see the, the skyline where you saw, you know, Kevin just holding on the newspaper, and you see, like, the, the Statue of Liberty, which has been blocked, and on the side it says, Wet Bandits Escape, and then you see all these other... Uh, still shots of of all these um, scenes right there uh, typical Fox I know um, yes it's bare bones the only thing they have are just trailers of the first three Home Alone movies which I find this amazing because um, Home Alone 3 trailer is included but there's no Blu-ray release whatsoever unless you have to end up getting a, a custom-made Blu-ray it's not a real one but if, if that's the case you have to take then you might as well take it but I really hope that someday Fox would actually release that I mean I know it's the lesser of the two um, but that's all you get yeah just the, the code I already used it, and you get these, whatever. Um, now before we get to the review, um, the first time I saw Home Alone 2 Lost in New York, I went to see it with my cousin Opa, along with my Uncle Louie, went to go see it at AMC uh, Burbank 14 in Burbank, California, which has already been demolished, because we they put it directly to the, the next um, corner, which is now known as AMC Burbank 16. Yeah, it has IMAX and Dolby Cinema and all that included with a lot of shops. Yeah, that, that's where the theater used to be because they, they demolished it and became 
a apartment complex, but it has a lot of stores and restaurants um, built on the corner. But that's where we went to see it. And I love it, though, when it first came out. I mean, after seeing the original Home Alone in theaters as a five-year-old kid, you know, actually having a bad day at the time, um, during the start of Christmas vacation, and um, it, it really made it up for it because, you know, I just couldn't stop laughing. I had a good time. It was nice to follow a child actor like Macaulay Colgan, you know, getting in some action, you know, throwing some one-liners and dialogue and breaking the fourth wall and and all that and try to set all these traps on on these two wet bandits uh, yeah Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern you know I mean this is the first time Joe Pesci got to play a whole uh, menacing role compared to what he does in in the Martin Scorsese pictures yeah we always have to become a foul mouth but here, you know, he's doing his best not to uh, curse, considering, you know, he's just giving some what of a, like a Yosemite Sam, always uh, grunting and ranting and stuff. Even this movie was even better than ever, and I, I just couldn't stop laughing the same way. Uh, the, the traps in the movie were incredibly... Um, a lot nastier and meaner than the first movie. I mean, it, by comparison, the traps in the film was actually more tamer. I mean, only thing that they got for was the blowtorch, um, the needle. But other than that, though, nothing much. But this one was actually more painful than ever before. I mean, geez, they barely survived for all of that. I couldn't believe it. I mean... Both uh, Harvey and Marv almost died <laughs> during those particular scenes. And, yeah, we're going to talk about that when I get to the review. And it was also nice to have cameos included, too. Yes, including Donald Trump, our future president of the United States. But I don't want to get political. I mean, the main reason why he got a cameo was because um, he owned the Plaza Hotel. So, I mean, he owns everything. Um, he's impeached, by the way, <laughs> as I'm talking about the review, but, um, the less we talk about him, the better. There was Ali Sheedy in the movie, um, there was also, uh, the scene where he was watching a, a game show, which also features Bob Eubanks, the host, that has Jimmy Walker from Good Times, and, and I, there's even a cameo of the director, uh, Chris Columbus, uh, who happens to direct this movie. The best thing about this movie, though, was that uh, this is the first film that actually features the Top Boy tape recorder. And yes, every kid who saw Home Alone 2 wanted one. Even me. I wanted a tape recorder ever since. Um, but actually... Before that movie even came out, I actually did want to have a tape recorder because I, I remember uh, my cousin was in college and she had a, a micro cassette recorder. I, I started fooling around with it as a kid. I, I just couldn't stop. It's funny because I used to be scared of of uh, tape recorders. As, yeah, I know. I was a bit of a wimp at the time, but I, hey, I was only a little boy. I didn't realize it back then, but then I ever since I saw that recorder and I started recording my voice I was like I was having so much fun with it I always wanted one I, I can't help it so unfortunately I didn't get the Top Boy tape recorder until um, I was in Oregon when I was 14 years old yeah we had to stay in Oregon for a while for like a couple months and I found this at um, at a local uh, first store um, which is like Goodwill, but quite different. I think it was called Desert uh, Industries, I think. That's where I found one. Um, already used, uh, but it does have the the cassette uh, included. So I just go around fooling with it, you know, having fun with it. It was, oh man. And I still have it, by the way, but it's in all in my containers um, in the closet. So I, I can't get it out right now. I wanted to. I, I, I begged to do this, but I couldn't, but hey, that's fine. It still works. 
It just needs batteries. Um, I wish we had some more of those uh, cassette tapes, but, well, we can't find any more. But unless they bring it back, if, if they ever, there might be a chance. <laughs> okay. But with that said, uh, let's get to the review. It stars Macaulay Colgan, Joe Pesci, Daniel Stern, John Hurd. Uh, yeah, he passed away uh, two years ago. That was his soul. Uh, Tim Curry. Uh, Brendan Fricker uh, from My Left Foot. Catherine O'Hara. Uh, Devin Rattray. Um, Hilary Wolf. Marine Elizabeth Shea. Michael C. Marana, yeah, from the Benches of Pete and Pete, Gary Bamman, Kieran Cogan, yes, uh, Macaulay Cogan's his brother, um, Eddie Bracken, no longer with us, but he went on to do uh, Rookie of the Year next, uh, Rob Schneider, yes, from Saturday Night Live, and he went on to do a lot of movies, the, yeah, the movies that Sandler produces, and of course he's been in movies with Adam Sandler, so yeah. Uh, and yes, we know that he had a daughter um, who happens to be uh, a rock singer named Ellie Keane. Uh, Dana Ivory, uh, who was in the movie uh, The Adams Family, along with the sequel, uh, she was also in the movie uh, The Color Purple. Uh, yeah, the movie with Robert Goldberg, uh, Danny Glover, and Oprah Winfrey, yeah, directed by Steven Spielberg. Um, uh, Ralph Foody, yes, which uh, he makes an appearance in this one uh, after the first movie where Kevin was watching an old gangster film. Yeah, it's a fictionalized movie, by the way. Yeah, Bob Eubanks, I mentioned. Uh, yeah, Rip Taylor, I forgot to mention him. Uh, J.P. Morgan, and of course, uh, Jimmy Walker. Uh, Ali Sheedy, yes, she plays the New York ticket agent. Um, yeah, Chris Columbus, the director, yes, he was the patron for Duncan's Choice Chess. Uncredited, by the way. Uh, yes, Donald Trump. Because, of course, he's the owner of, of the Plaza Hotel at the time. But uh, actually, he directs to Kevin where the lobby is, so that, that's what he was doing. And uh, Ron Canada, who's a police officer from Times Square. Um, anyway, it's written by John Hughes, he's also the producer, and it's directed by Chris Columbus. The movie begins when we meet the McAllister family, including uh, Peter and Kate, both played by John Hurd and Kevin O'Hara. Yeah, this time, you know, she was given a, a new look, you know, like a different perm instead of what she looked like in the original film. Um, so they live in their Chicago home, as we know. So we meet um, Kevin McAllister, Macaulay Cogan, who um, figures that, you know, going to Florida on Christmas just doesn't seem right because it's due to the tropical climate that it was going on and not to mention the lack of Christmas trees, yes. So um, they're already packing up, you know, getting ready to go while Kevin was playing with his... Uh, Top Boy tape recorder, you know, just while he was watching a game show called Ding Ding Dawn. And yes, he's, he's just going around recording, yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, rewinding back and forth. Uh, there's that one scene where he wants up going the, straight to the, the bathroom because he was about to get his tie. Um, yeah, he bumps into um, his uncle while he was singing the song, The Cool Jerk. In the shower, and he just goes around saying, "Get out of here, you nosy little pervert! Or I'm gonna slap you silly!" <laughs> yeah, because it's he started to pull a prank on him, you know, just recording the that particular moment. So then they wind up at the school pageant, and this is where it gets pretty uh, humiliating. That Buzz, because as a jerk of a brother he is, he started, um, you know, humiliating the Kevin during his solo, you know, by taking out the two candles, you know, started putting in his ears, and started uh, banging his head like a drum. Yeah, 
the entire crowd started laughing and they were shocked. And then next thing you know, uh, Kevin actually pushes uh, Buzz and and the rest of uh, the kids have fell down. And then a cardboard tree actually fell down into the the school teacher, who's the piano player. Yeah, the piano lady. Uh, that scene, I, I just couldn't stop laughing every time I saw that scene. Because <laughs> it's so messed up. So, yes, um, apparently Kevin got into trouble, even though it wasn't his fault. I mean, the real, the real blame is Buzz, because he's the one who started this mess. I mean, he, he know he didn't mean it. So, what happened was, Buzz decided to apologize to Kevin right in front of the family, hoping, you know, they'll actually accept it. But we know that Buzz is lying. He actually calls him a trout snuffer. So what he did was he just go uh, over there to the family telling them, I'm not sorry. You know, I did this because Buzz humiliated me. And the fact that you believe in his stupid lies, why, why would I bother going to this lousy Florida trip anyway? So he decided to go straight to, to the room, which is the attic, which happens to be the same place where he actually went straight up um, in the first movie. Um, yeah, the same place that uh, his brother, or yeah, his brother had to sleep in. So he, he complained to um, his mother, you know, Kate, uh, about this, about what just going around and and he was trying, and Kate was trying to tell uh, Kevin to, to go back downstairs to apologize to Buzz about what he acted. And then, and then he says, I'm not going to apologize to Buzz. I'd rather kiss a toilet seat. And then Kate just says, then you're going to stay up to the rest of the room all day. Well, and then he just complained and ranted and say, yeah, well, I don't care. I'm, I'm going to stay in there for the rest of my life. And... And if I grow up, I'm going to start having my own vacation so I can do whatever I want without you or anyone. And he basically got his Christmas wish. <laughs> yeah, just like how in the first movie he made his whole entire family disappear. <laughs> okay. Um, so then the next morning, um, yes, just like the first movie, I mean, only this time. Even though there was uh, a windy night, uh, luckily the power didn't went out, so that's a plus. But what happened was he, the alarm actually went off because he accidentally unplugged it, just trying to get uh, the plug out. So then they both realized that, yes, um, they overslept and they did it again. So now they have to get ready as soon as possible so they can get straight into um, the airport terminal so they'll, they'll be able to make it um, yeah so they had to ride on these uh, airport express and yeah they always keep knocking the the statue every time but you get the point and but luckily Kevin didn't get ditched this time that's a good thing however because he's running out of batteries on his top boy tape recorder he wanted to get out the batteries um, that's inside um, his father's bag so he took he did took the bag um, and they were rushing as fast as they can so they can make it on time just to get to their plane the American Express uh, the American Airlines plane that's going around to the trip to Miami Florida however he stopped right in the middle of it so he can put in his batteries uh, inside the tape recorder and he was ready to be on his way um, he was hoping that he did spot his father, but it turned out to be someone else. Yeah, we always get confused here. Um, but it already boarded, and now um, he was trying to make it, but then he realized that yeah, he just bumped into the lady. Uh, he dropped his boarding pass all the way around, and he was hoping he would make it just in time. So they had, so the the tick the agents around started to tell him to board him to the, straight to the plane. What he didn't realize, though, was that he did took the wrong plane, and it's going straight to New York. And that's what happened. And once he finally made it there, while well, the family is going all the way to, 
in Florida. Well, he was, to his belief, he was shocked because you know he he thought that his father was there, but he thought the family was there, but he realized you know there's something not right there, and he had to sit on the seat next to that French guy. Or yeah, I think he was French. Um, yeah, he's putting on his headphones and stuff. Uh, but when he finally made it, yes, he realized that he he did took the wrong plane and he wants up in New York and <laughs> and that's where he was talking to the ticket agent uh, who happens to be played by Alice Sheedy. Um, hard to believe that was her. Um, and he just says, "Yikes, I did it again." And she says, "Something wrong, sir?" And he says, "I'll be fine." So then he says to himself, "My family's in Florida and I'm in New York." My family's in Florida, and I'm in New York. Yeah, he's... I, I don't know, I, I had trouble with the eyebrows, but... Trich, but... You get the idea. So he explores uh, the entire city. You know, he's going around onto the taxi cab, where he's in the Brooklyn Bridge. And then he goes around to the Empire Diner, where he spots a tall, dressed-up Santa Claus. <laughs> I thought that was really cool. Um... He goes around taking pictures, you know, and just looking at the, the viewfinder, uh, going to Central Park and other places, and and not only that, but yes, he got to go all the way on top to the Twin Towers, uh, World Trade Center. Um, yeah, I, I know, because it's already gone already, you know, the ever since the tragedy that happened. But having to see him go all the way on the top is really kind of terrifying. Uh, kind of terrifying if you think about it. I mean, even if you see it now. I mean, I'm just glad Fox didn't edit it out, thank goodness. I and mean, they should never do that. Not even in future releases. Um, so the next thing you know, um, uh, because of what just happened, um, they, the family found out that Kevin was missing because they just took out uh, Kevin's luggage. Um, they went directly to uh, his brother, I believe, and yeah, then he wants to meet those old people, and then all, all of them say, Kevin's not here. And that's when, you know, Kate screams, Kevin! And fates. So they, they went to um, the airport security to explain what just happened. That, yes, this did happen before. You know, they, they did left him by accident. Um... So they're hoping they'll find a way to contact him since he's in New York. You know, maybe they'll, um, maybe they'll find a way to track down through, which at this rate would be the credit card, yeah, the Visa credit card that that was uh, his, that was of course uh, Kevin's uh, father, you know, Peter. Yeah, it was his because he took the bag uh, all the way. So yes, um, Kevin did went to the Plaza Hotel. Just to check in and be able to spend the entire hotel room, you know, just going around eating some ice cream and and uh, watching some old gangster films and stuff. Yeah, which I thought that was pretty clever that they even did a sixth, <laughs> a sequel called Angels with Even Filthier Souls. And that's where we saw, um, yes, um, the gangster um, Johnny. <laughs> Uh, and yes, the film is fictionalized, just like the first film. Only this time, he shot down um, he shot down a woman instead of a guy because yeah, she was smooching with his brother, and he's going around flirting with everyone and all that. That he had to shot him down. He had to shot her down by saying, "Merry Christmas, you filthy animal, and a happy New Year." Yeah, pretty messed up. Um, uh, of course, uh, just when he got in, I mean, yes, we do see um, he just went to the, the desk uh, lobby where he meets uh, Hester Stone, played by uh, Dana Irie. You know, just checking in, uh, grabbing the, the Visa credit card, actually telling them that my father actually came here. I mean, you don't see him, but he's just going to work. You know, he's just lying. And he's telling them that, you know, I do a lot of mischief and stuff. So we all do. <laughs> so 
So he checks in, uh, but then we meet um, a concierge uh, named um, named Mr. Hector, played by uh, Tim Curry. Yeah, he, I mean he's very suspicious the way he the way he's doing that uh, facial expressions. I mean, anytime you have Tim Curry in the movie, you know you're in for it. Because, I mean, he's up to no good. <laughs> um, but, of course, you got um, Rolf Schneider playing Cedric, who's the bellhop. You know, he's the one who's taking um, all the stuff and luggage uh, to his room and gives him the key. Um, so that way he'll be able to open all the stuff that they have. You know, they have cookies, uh, refreshments and stuff, everything. So you get to do whatever you want. You got a TV. Uh, you got some nice spacious and um, beautiful uh, bathroom. You, know, you get to take a shower, do everything. So it's awesome. And yes, he even goes to the swimming pool where <laughs> he decided to make a, a splash uh, doing a cannonball, but then he, he, his shorts uh, suddenly came off. <laughs> Yikes! So, so yes, he was um, actually having the best time of his life, or what seems to be. Um, because that is until that, you know, that particular night where the concierge just came in, um, trying to sneak in to, to Kevin's room, um, yeah, housekeeping, and then he, he suddenly tricks him by pretending like someone is actually inside the bathroom, you know, taking a shower. He took out the, the Bozo the Clown, the <laughs> inflatable, uh, toy that, and just messing around with it, and and while he's playing the, which he did record it directly from the Top Boy tape recorder, that that prank that he did, and that was just hilarious. And and, <laughs> and he just ran as fast as he got shocked. He ran as fast as he can. He he got he knocked his leg on through the table stool. <laughs> just hilarious. So yes, the next morning he. Um, he was about to go to a local toy store called Duncan's Toy Chest, riding on a limousine, and um, yes, greeted with cheese pizza and drinking some Coca-Cola. Um, as you may know, yes, I mean this might as well be the Coca-Cola of the sequel because you know the first movie had Pepsi, so here we got Coca-Cola. <laughs> okay, and he was watching The Grinch, yeah, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, the original, and when he saw that transition, that's where you begin to see. Uh, the transition of of Mr. Hector, yeah, the concierge, and when he was trying to find out about um, the Visa credit card that he found, which happens to be Peter's, by the way, and then a after he processes through the machine, he began to find out that it was stolen, which isn't really stolen, of course, because it is his father's credit card. So yes, it was a credit card flawed. I mean, he, he's been, like, spending a lot of stuff, spending on room service, all of that, and, and he's even spending more money that he has inside his envelope. Um, I think this is part of the Christmas bonus he was given, um, giving half the money to charity or getting all the stuff that he needs. So, so anyway, he, he bumps into what was supposed to be just a, a, a an employee at Duncan's Toy Chest, which is like an FAO Schwartz uh, which happens to be F.A.O. old shorts if you think about it, um, because they built it in. They just used the uh, as a exterior and inside. Okay, so that's why he's getting all the stuff that he needs. Uh, and that's when yes, he suddenly bumps into which I know uh, right in the middle of the film we did got to see Harry and Marv played by Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern. Uh, they they appeared uh, directly inside a um, a fish truck, and they're about to escape from free. Uh, so now they they're about to escape from jail after staying in for nine months, and they wound up in New York. Um, and yes, they actually changed their name to Stinky Bandits. Well, Marv came up with the idea. Yeah, he actually came up. He actually wrapped around his uh, hand with uh, with tape that sticks, so he goes around stealing everything. Yeah, like he steals the charity money. He goes around stealing their hats, uh, their <laughs> their mitts, and and all this other um, other stuff that it that he was given. So, 
So, yeah, their plan was uh, they're about to take down the Duncan's toy chest to steal all the money in the cash registers and and the charity money that they're going to plan on. Um, so, yes, um, hard to believe that they did spot it, um, Kevin after all this time because they figured they, f they thought they saw someone. Um, I, I know um, Marf actually got bumped into... Um, a young woman. I mean, I mean, at first you thought that he was going to steal um, her purse, but he wasn't because his hand got caught in there, and he was just speaking uh, French, and then he gets uh, bitch slapped. Um, this happened uh, again too when when he uh, captured, uh, yeah, along with Harry, um, you know, Kevin, and then Kevin decided to f have a plan so he can escape from these two guys, um, which he also did too. Um, <laughs> oh god, I'm going over the place. Uh, yes, which the, the same woman actually punched both of them in the face and just when he was about to escape. Uh, okay, um, but before that actually happened, um, you know, he was already being chased down by Harry and Marv. Uh, he was running as fast as he can. Then he has to pay for the, um, the necklace uh, from a local... Um, seller and then yet yeah, he's running as fast as he can takes out the necklace breaks apart and just throws all the way down into the the sidewalk and then just when both Harry and Marf uh, came running as fast as they can to grab him they they tripped and they hurt their heads and stuff and he was about to go back to the Plaza Hotel only to find out that yes, um, the concierge, Mr. Hector, had had took out uh, his his father's uh, credit card, you know, Visa, and he was about to be chased down by him along with um, Centric and uh, Hester, which is sort of a similar scene to the first movie, you know, where he he wants to become a shoplifter. After stealing the, the toothbrush, but that was an accident because he spotted the old man, and um, but he just wants to slide him in into the elevators to get away from him. And yes, uh, <laughs> uh, they both got caught in and they all fell down. Um, very cartoonish in a way. <laughs> so. <laughs> so so what Kevin does was he went back to the hotel room, you know, takes some cookies, put it inside his father's bag, and was ready to leave before the rest of the hotel um, employees were about to go inside the room, and and that's where he starts to play the movie, you know, the gangster film, which I thought this was very hilarious. I mean, even though you thought that maybe, you know. Mr. Hector and the rest were just watching the movie. Actually, they're just hearing uh, the noise from the TV that came from the back room. So, I thought that was pretty clever because it's almost acting like, yeah, the the fodder was the <laughs> was indeed the uh, the gangster who actually has a Tommy gun and was ready to shoot uh, <laughs> the rest of the hotel guests. So that was just hilarious. And, uh, and the way they they recite that scene, I, I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> Um, they they must have improvised that because um, I, I like how when, yeah they were, they went down on their knees you know because I know they're gonna be <laughs> they know that this guy had a they didn't realize that he had a gun but they did and he was telling them exactly what he was saying he says I love you <laughs> and you saw Kevin laughing and then while well, he was just fast forwarding it just getting to his dialogue you know Johnny and, and then there's and then he says, you got to do better than that. And they all say, I love you. <laughs> then they're about to leave. And yes, we hear the line at the end. Merry Christmas, you filthy animal, and a happy new year. So he escapes, and that's where Harry and Marf uh, catches him. And yeah, I just mentioned that already. So after he finally escapes from these two guys, um, even though they're, they're going for their plan, um... He actually uh, meets uh, a pigeon lady, which he saw a little earlier, but she's played by Brennan Fricker. So all she does um, throughout the entire city was uh, to carry all these pigeons around. Um, she only, uh, she does, um, 
I guess she she does have a bit of a a, a hideout somewhere, which uh, happens to be inside an a uh, orchestra place. But yeah, at, at a local theater where they had an orchestra um, that was going around. Uh, oh, jeez, I'm going over. Uh, okay, I know. So, I mean, this is kind of like uh, the first movie where we had the old man, you know, they're trying to explain the problems going around. So, so the pigeon lady was exactly the opposite. Only, she doesn't have any friends. I mean, the only friends that he has was just the pigeons. So, that's what she spends on around. Um, and even though he did... Uh, suddenly spotted him after all these pigeons came out eating all of, of the cookies that he had. Um, oh, yeah, not to mention he suddenly meets these, um, a bunch of weirdos around at night, you know, like the the prostitutes, uh, the homeless guy, even that creepy uh, taxi cab driver. Um, yeah. Um, so they had to, so like the first movie, yeah, Kevin had to explain his problems. Um, this time with the pigeon lady, and she had her problems too. Like she did once had a family. She did marry a a husband, but didn't work out. So now she's all alone, and and by the time um, um, everything's all set, because um, since he did went to Duncan's toy chest, I mean. Uh, which it did turn out to be Mr. Duncan, yeah, Eddie Bracken. Um, he also gave uh, Kevin the the turtle doves um, as a gift you know, because of the charity that he was given, you know, only a dollar uh, for the um, the St. Anne's Children's Hospital. And when he in when he went there, though, um, he actually spotted a kid all the way up in the hospital and hoping that there's a they'll find a way to actually. Uh, you know, be able to stop uh, Harry and Marv uh, from stealing all that money, including the charity money for the hospital. And this is where he finally uh, sets up the traps um, directly from, because uh, he learns that um, his uncle lives in New York, but they're about to spend time under Christmas vacation in Paris, or perhaps maybe not the Christmas vacation, but the entire... Um, maybe entire months or so, staying there for a long time. Because we learned that um, Rob's house is being renovated. Yeah, the entire place is already uh, not looking in great shape. You could tell that they're bringing all these paint buckets and and they're trying to rebuild uh, all the rooms that are all around. Yeah, they have like a tool shed and everything. Yeah, they, they cover all the, the stuff that they need. So they're trying to fix the place. Uh, period, but it's all been left abandoned, but they're all left abandoned, so yeah, I guess for the holidays. So at this rate, um, this became uh, the perfect place to set the traps uh, for the two red bandits, or sticky bandits, you got, starting with uh, both of them going straight into the Duncan's toy chest, which they, they hide out inside those two houses. Um, hoping that the close is clear so this will be the perfect night to steal all that money then Kevin finally arrives takes a picture and he, he was ready to throw um, a brick with a note inside into the window so that way you know they can set up the alarms and hoping that uh, the cops and Mr. Duncan will find out what happened and that's when the whole trap is set where <laughs> Uh, they actually put in a seesaw, <laughs> you know, with the bucket, and this is when, when Harry wants up on one side, and then, and then Martha's on the other, and then suddenly uh, Harry went all the way up in the air and fell and landed all the way down into the car, and I'm like, whoa! <laughs> I was surprised he survived through that, um, and if that wasn't enough, well, this is where Kevin went straight to the tunnel of the apartment so he went all the way up on top of the roof and this is where he starts throwing all these bricks which landed straight at at Marf <laughs> several times <laughs> hoping that he wasn't going to have any more and just 
And then uh, Harry was just tricking him, you know, actually lying to him and stuff, hoping that uh, Kevin was going to throw, um, you know, Harry the camera, so hoping they, both of them won't do any harm to him, but, you know, they're lying. So then, um, as it starts, you know, they, they uh, Marv went straight to the door, already getting knocked out and getting unconscious after dealing with these bricks. Uh, he went inside, suddenly got stuck with the staple gun. It, it's The staple gun went straight into his butt, and I think it went into his nuts, and and then it went straight into his nose, yeah, just trying to open the door, for the doorknob, and got caught into it. And then next thing you know, um, he got back in there, he kicks the door, and then he says, Harry, I reached the top! And then he fell all the way down into that huge hole. <laughs> and I just said, well, now you just reached the bottom. <laughs> so he suffers from a broken cracked neck, but he just cracks it completely. <laughs> and then he cracks his back, and he says, whoa, what a hole! And then he just goes... Um, straight um, into that slippery floor yeah filled with all this uh, gooey uh, soda that he just used and went straight into the um, the shelves of the paint cans covered with paint yeah after he slips up um, and then next thing you know yes uh, we had that art the RC the ACDC uh, controller which which um, Kevin just sets up uh, connected through the sink. Yes, this is the the most an incredible scene you ever remembered. Was yes, Marf got electrocuted, and he turns into a skeleton, all shocked, <laughs> filled with his hair, <laughs> all blown up like an afro, and yeah, it's like all skeletons. So he's trying to become more cartoonish, and <laughs> then next thing you know, he goes around. Um, you know, trying to, because uh, there's a rope, uh, he was trying to get all the way up to that hole, but it turns out that it was a uh, 100 pounds of plaster that f that fell all the way up down to him. <laughs> and he's, he says at the end, you know, covered with plaster, I'm going to murder that kid. Um, Harry, on the other hand, isn't so lucky, because, yes, he was trying to get up to the ladder, but it's all filled with that goop. Um, then he tries to go inside the door, which is filled with all these tool bag, uh, which is which the tool bag is connected, and all these tools fell on him. They did an alternate take on that scene where all the tools fell on him, and the big wrench hits his head, and then he fell. But instead, in this scene, you know, all the tools just fell on him. Even that big wrench fell <laughs> on him on his head. And then next thing you know, he he tries to to check out all these lamps. Yeah, yeah he, he turns it on hoping that nothing's going to caught on fire, which eventually he did. Kind of like the the blowtorch scene and in, in the 1990 in Home Alone, of course. Um, but yes, uh, he did actually got his head on fire, but it was um, I think it was another flame flower, I believe, or it could be another uh, blowtorch. Um, so apparently uh, he was he was trying to get the fire away from his head, uh, but then yes, his head was on fire. You know, if it was beanie, you, you know, he was trying to turn on the sink, but no water. So what he he does was he put his head straight into the toilet seat and then explodes. <laughs> oh man. Um, and yeah, he even tried to go up to the ladder too, but you know, just when Kevin was about to go all the way up. And then the the ladder cracked and he fell all the way down. While uh, Marf was trying to go all the way up, you know, trying to make it up to, uh, to the hole. So then they went up to the stairs. Um, yeah, just like the take in, in the first movie, you know, getting the knocked down by all these paint cans. Only this time, it's a <laughs> it's a uh, they got knocked down by. I think that's supposed to be, um, I think one of those, um, um, yeah, one of those pipes. Yeah, I, I think it's, yeah, it's a huge pipe, and it just uh, 
slams both of them all the way down into the hole and they, they even counted the numbers you know that's one that's two yeah just tricking him with the paintball I mean with the paint cans but then it was free and then there's four <laughs> Uh, so they try to uh, go all the way up, and yes, he even says, um, "You guys give up? Um, have you have any more pain?" And and then <laughs> Marv just says, "Never!" <laughs> so they they continue to go on with some more traps, um, which at this rate the tool shed. Uh, which actually causes them to have a broken nose. Ugh. Oh, man. And then next thing you know, um, they're about to go all the way on top of the roof, which Kevin was about to go all the way down with a rope that's being filled with kerosene. So now um, they try to go down as quickly as possible to grab uh, Kevin, but then next thing you know, Kevin just lights up the rope that silk into it and, and now they're about to go all the way up and <laughs> and then next thing you know um, they fell all the way down and then then couples of cans of varnish went straight into both of them all soak in it and now they're now they're continuing to chase them down just when he already uh, called the cops and they're going straight into the central park so they they grab uh, more they grab Cameron after, um, you know, he just uh, slipped on onto uh, a pail of snow. So now um, we we also learned that yes, um, Harry does have a gun. He was ready to shoot him until the pigeon lady finally arrives and with the pigeons and yeah, she grabbed she took some uh, some bird seeds to throw all the way at them. So that way all these pigeons will go attack them. So completely be until uh, Kevin lights up the, f the fireworks and, and the cops arrive. They arrested both of them. <laughs> and now, um, well, he's set free. So he's, he's just going around, wandering around in uh, the Rockefeller Plaza. And that's where he saw the Christmas tree all light up. A uh, big Christmas tree. And it just explained to them about that he'll he'll regret himself, and he you know he'll take back everything what he said about his family. That no matter what happens, I will always love him. You know. So yes, um, the Bacalister family. You know they were already in in the, um, Florida. The, yeah, they were watching the. Um, it's a Wonderful Life in Spanish. You know there's an English version, so they would have played it. Um, but they went head out to New York. They stayed at Plaza Hotel because they tracked down the credit card number about what happened. They, yeah, they uh, both, well, Kate and, and Peter, at this rate, Kate, uh, got mad at um, all three of them for what they did. You know, they scared them away and hoping they'll check in. But Kate, of course, had to go all the way, wandering around New York just to find him. And surprisingly enough, uh, she did. Although, she almost missed it at just before the traps are set. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, they finally made... So, Ke so, Kate had finally found Kevin all the way at the Rockefeller Plaza and where the Christmas tree is. And things were going great. So, now they finally went back. The Plaza Hotel. They stayed in, um, and it's it's Christmas. I mean, it happened on Christmas Eve, but now it's Christmas, and they woke up and they got all the presents all um, received from everyone, including the Duncan's toy chest. Uh, yeah, which Mr. Duncan gave him the present after the note that he received, and all the money has been returned. So that way they'll be sent directly to the, the children's hospital. That they'll earn everything they need. You know, they'll be able to earn all the gifts over there. So yes, he got a gift. And then next thing you know, he took the, the turtle doves uh, the, that's uh, hanging on the Christmas tree. And it was given one to uh, the pigeon lady. So everything turned out um, turned out fine. Uh, excellent. Uh, that is until... 
Uh, the room service bill uh, came along, um, yeah, that that the Cindric brought in uh, to Buzz, and yeah, he had a <laughs> giving him the tips uh, of the uh, chewing gum, and that's when he found out that yes, he spent over nine hundred and sixty-seven dollars on room service. That was pretty messed up, but yeah, it's an excellent sequel. Yes, I know I spoiled the surprise, but I don't care. You know, I, I just love to have fun, you know, adding some details and review the film like I'm actually watching it. But, you know me. <laughs> um, even though Home Alone is a classic, I love the movie too. And I'm happy that at least I finally got the Blu-ray. That's the 4K restoration. It has all the features. I wish the Home Alone 2 Lost in New York has features. Like, for example, the behind-the-scenes... Uh, documentary that they could have put in uh, that actually aired on Fox which was hosted by Catherine O'Hara and explained how they did this movie and how they did the stunts and all the work that they put into it it would have been fun hell I would have loved to have a commentary with the director Chris Columbus because they actually worked together um, with Colgan so I, I loved having him explain about what just happened in the movie even though it's deja vu over and over and how they how they put everything together, you know, how they're just doing exactly a second take, like the first movie, you know, it just repeats itself. But they they all learn about what happened in the past, which it could happen again. Um, yeah, in that sort of way. Uh, but deep down of it, I mean, I know Kevin's been going through problems with his family. You know, he's always been the the pigeon or being the outcast. Because, you know, seeing that he's the only kid on the block that doesn't get much of the attention, they always keep telling him he's helpless and stuff. But the way they treat him, I mean, that's exactly what we have to deal with. And, of course, you have to have a brother who's a bully. Um, um, there wasn't much for the, the characters, though, because, you know, they're just there. I mean, you do know who the characters are, but... You know, they, they don't get enough screen time as far as I'm concerned. You know, I know Buzz is there and and I know all the rest of the game were there. Uh, I, I also forgot to mention that there was Senta Moses, who ha the same girl who went on to do the TV show Beekman's World, uh, which I believe she was the uh, the third uh, uh, Beak girl. Uh, yeah, she plays uh, Tracy uh, in the movie. So I guess there were some changes here, um, but always, you know, they're pretty much the same. Yeah, even the uncle and and his and the grandmother and all, all the rest of the family relatives. Okay, I know I'm going over the place. Um, it's nice to have Tim Curry in the film. I mean, he was uh, devilishly excellent as the concierge, uh, Mr. Hector. Um, Rob Schneider was um, very funny at times, um, but it was hey, it's good to have him. Um, yes, because he's always getting all these tips, Well, which I know there was one scene where Kevin was going to give, which he has a lot of money on his hands to give uh, um, Cendric the tip, uh, which he had just gives him a, a Food Stripes uh, gum and stick. So he's, you know, he's chewing some gum and all that. Or, um, or, or even some other uh, scenes here and there. Um, with the cast. Um, but yes, I mean you do see the pranks, you still you do see the traps, um the way they were portrayed here, you know, the running time was a little bit longer than than the original running time. Um yes it could have some mistakes here and there. Yes there there could be some flaws here and there, which I, I know it's hard to explain. It really is hard to explain sometimes because you never know what was going to happen next. Um, but with that aside, I, you know, they did the best they could to, you know, trying to make you know another successful uh, sequel. They wanted this to become a franchise, so there you have it. Um, also, the fact that Colgan was paid 4.5 million dollars to appear in there. Yeah, I mean, compared to the budget that he was given, so. I know, he, he was very rich. 
at the time. I mean, he really was. I mean, he was the richest uh, child actor to ever star in, in the, the most popular franchise of all. I know they couldn't do another sequel, or maybe they would have ended it this way. And Quite honestly, it, it should have ended better with the second movie. I thought it did end it very well, too. But I, I know, they want to continue to go on with the franchise, so they have to go for Home Alone Free with a different cast, but at least they're not portraying the roles that the McAllisters were. So at least they went for a different family this time, and they had four crooks, which are this rate spies. They're trying to go after the uh, the chip that's hidden inside a Tyco RC. Um, you got a mean next door neighbor. Yes, uh, you do get uh, Scarlett Johansson as his sister. Um, Alex D. Lynn, of course, plays uh, Alex. Smart kid. Well, yeah, at times he's smart. Um, but of course, he had to stay home because he had the chicken pox. Yeah, he has a was a brother who's who's a bit almost like Buzz, but <laughs> even meaner. But he does have. Uh, he does have a, a pet parrot, and they also throw him with a mouse um, that he has, and has a different kind of family, you know, father and mother. You know, they had to work, and they had to get out of the house because, you know, they want to get contagious with chicken pox and stuff. Okay, okay, I know. Um, boy, this is going on the ground. Um, yes, um... Like the first movie, they both have video games, um, lots of them, yeah, lots of them from other uh, accessories, you know, like Sega Genesis, Nintendo Entertainment System, Super Nintendo, Top uh, Game Boy, computers, I mean, everything. And, of course, um, the movie became this popular that, yes, we did actually have a Top Boy tape recorder, as I already mentioned already. Um, that uh, that Tiger Electronics created. So that's part of the tie-in. Um, and yeah, this was a huge hit, just like the first film. Um, it was actually doing so well, and even though it was going on behind uh, other films like The Bodyguard, Aladdin, uh, Muppets Christmas Carol, yeah, a lot of films were coming out, becoming the third highest uh, grossing uh, film of of the of the holiday season of 1992. So yeah, and, but unfortunately it did got some negative reviews when it came, well yeah, from critics, what do you expect? I mean, hard to believe Rotten Tomatoes gave it a 33%, which I don't, which I don't understand, I'm sorry. I mean, yes, they, they, they basically criticized it because the film had had very strong cartoon violence in the movie. That's the whole point, of course. And they tried to duplicate with that. You know, they thought that uh, it got so cartoonish that it's not funny, which I'm sorry. What do you expect, man? I mean, I, I understand it does have to deal with um, Deja Vu issues. Yeah, like they borrow the same plot from the first movie. Yeah, it's going to happen again and again, only this time he's stuck in New York. But it still has a different approach. So instead of being stuck home alone in his own house, it's he just wanders around in the Big Apple. So I thought that was interesting, too. Um, also has a great soundtrack, too. Um, yes, you even got uh, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Yeah, God rest his soul for Tom Petty. Um, he had a song called um, called Christmas uh, All Over Again. Uh, there's even a song by a TLC called Sleigh Ride. Um, there's even, which I don't know if it's in the, I don't think it's in the movie. I don't know. But it was uh, on the soundtrack, and I know there was... Uh, you know, John Williams, uh, who does the score, the compose of, of all the fiends, even the song Merry Christmas. Um, and, um, yes, there's even a song called Somewhere in My Memory by Bette Midler. Yes, uh, Bette Midler actually sang the song. Uh, the My Christmas Tree was actually composed by, you guessed it, Alan Minkin, uh, the the same man who composed for Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, 
uh, Aladdin, and yes, even uh, Enchanted in Little Shop of Horrors remake. Um, which I love. I mean, I love Enchanted, of course. Um, there's also Jingle Bell Rock, uh, Cool Jerk, as I mentioned. Um, it's a beginning to look a lot like Christmas, sung by Johnny Mathis. Uh, I love that version. Um, you, you got a Holly Jolly Christmas by Alan Jackson. He has a country music singer and All Alone on Christmas or Darling Love. So, uh, not bad. Um, has a great, surprisingly great soundtrack here, just like the first film, but this one is even better. And I guess that explains the running time that they went into. And so. But I, I really wish that uh, Fox would have done so much better with this release. I mean, they should have, again, they should have added all this stuff. I would have loved to see some more featurettes and other things too, but what can we do? But I, other than that, though, I mean, I'm just, I'm just happy that at least, um, you know, we had a sequel. I mean, it can't be worse than Home Alone 4 or even Home Alone 5 that follows. I mean, after Home Alone 3. <laughs> yeah. But whatever. So anyway, um, still, I mean, if you love the first movie, I mean, I, I can see why not if you can actually deal with the sequel. But if you don't like the sequel and you'd rather stick to the first movie, then that's fine by me, but hey, to me it would it will always be the first two films. Um and I could deal with Home Alone Free, even though it's you know it's hated by many. And I know they said it's ridiculous, so I understand. But I, I would rather stay away from Home Alone Four and five will be so anyway, that's Home Alone 2, Lost in New York, and I give it four and a half stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.